Welcome, Ben Mama. The VIC-20 certainly wasn't Commodore's first computer. They were already riding high on the PET and known for producing a wide range of calculators too. But it was the one that repositioned the company as a producer of micros for the home. The PET was very much aimed at the business market. It had no colour, no sound, and only had text-based graphics. But the VIC-20 was bursting with colour, could produce arcade-like sounds, some music, and was also affordable too. It arrived at a time when the home computer market was just starting to explode, with companies like Apple, Atari, Texas Instruments, Sinclair and Tandy Radio Shack entering the arena with their own unique options. Despite this tough competition, Commodore quickly became one of the key players in this ever-growing sector, thanks to its competitive pricing, eye-catching advertising and widespread retail presence. The VIC-20 was very much a sign of things to come for Jack Trammell's company. Despite being a huge success and an integral part of Commodore's history, the VIC-20 isn't a computer you hear talked about that much these days. Although the recent release of a modern version in the form of the VIC-20 from Retro Games Limited has helped with that somewhat. So I thought this computer would make an ideal candidate for one of my amazing facts videos and you, my wonderful viewers, very much agreed when it won my re recent poll by a landslide. As many of you know, I always try to give my audience what they want, and so, without further ado, I present 10 amazing Commodore VIC-20 facts. I see by your job application, you've scored six million on the video game Munchman. Yeah. And I see you shot down two billion aliens from the planet Mongo. Yeah. You are good at computer games. So what do you know about computers? If you're going to spend your time playing video games, why not play them on something that can also teach you about computing? Get a Commodore VIC-20. It's tough to grow up in a computer age without learning about computers. Let's start this video off with one of the strangest pieces of trivia regarding the Commodore VIC-20. The fact it was released in Japan first. Now the obvious thing that stands out about this fact is that Commodore, as we all know, were an American company headquartered in Westchester, Pennsylvania. But they had by this time spread their wing pretty wide, with regional HQs in England, Germany and Japan, and it's the latter of those that's important. After several engineers quit Commodore and their subsidiary MOS Technology, more on that later, the final engineering for the VIC-20 prototype was handed over to a team in the land of the rising sun. A group of engineers led by Yash Terakura finished off the design in 1980 and the computer was released as the VIC-1001 at the end of that same year. It's unknown how this choice of name came about, but it saw that it was chosen on from the PET 2001, Commodore's previous home computer that took its name from the cult classic movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. The name was changed for the Western release a year after, but again the exact reason is unclear. The 20 in the computer's name was widely assumed to refer to the combined size of the system ROMs. 8K Basic plus 8K Kernel plus 4K Character ROM, but original designer Bob Yanis claimed that 20 meant nothing in particular and has said in interviews that we simply picked 20 because it seemed like a friendly number and the computer's marketing slogan was the friendly computer. I felt it balanced things out a bit since Vic sounded like the name of a truck driver. The Vic-20 was intended to be a lot more economical than Commodore's previous computer offering, the PET. Jack Trammell originally wanted something that was capable of competing with the then market leading Apple II, as well as Tandy Radio Shack's TRS-80 whilst offering more functionality as well as a much lower price. Basically, a computer that could be used by the whole family for a wide range of different tasks, but it didn't quite turn out like that. Based on this spec, Chuck Pedal and Bill Seiler had designed a computer named the TOI, standing for the Other Intellect, 
but this never went to market because it required an 80 column character display, which in turn required the MOS Technology 6564 chip. However, this chip could not be used in the TOI since it required very expensive static RAM to operate fast enough, thus defeating Jack's primary goal of his new computer being low price. In the meantime, new MOS engineer Robert Yanis had designed a computer that he dubbed the MicroPet and finished a prototype with help from Al Charpentier and Charles Winterbly. When Jack Tramiel was shown the MicroPet prototype, he immediately asked for it to be finished and ready for mass production following a limited demonstration at that year's CES show. The MicroPet was equipped with 5KB of static RAM and used the same MOS6502 CPU as its predecessor. But this is where it gets really interesting, because the video chip used in this computer was the MOS Technology VIC, a general purpose colour VDP designed by El Charpentier in 1977. This chip was originally intended for use in inexpensive display terminals and even more so, low priced games consoles like the Atari 2600 and Magnavox Odyssey 2. But Commodore could not find a market for the chip with potential console manufacturers preferring to develop their own. So into the VIC-20, as it subsequently became known, based on this chip it went, and a new string was added to the computer's bow that Jack didn't originally envisage, the ability to play proper video games. Whilst Commodore's previous computer, the PET, was only sold through authorised dealers, which mostly consisted of specialised computing stores, the VIC-20 was designed to be primarily sold at retail and aimed at families rather than computing enthusiasts and business users. Commodore soon struck up deals with a number of big department stores and toy shops where it would compete directly with game consoles like the Atari 2600 and Mattel in television. In fact, it was the first computer to be sold in famous US retail chain Kmart. To help facilitate this, Commodore took out a series of advertisements featuring iconic Hollywood actor William Shatner as his spokesperson. The man who most famously took up the role of Captain Kirk in Star Trek used these adverts to ask his audience questions like why buy just a video game and describing it as the wonder computer of the 1980s. I'm guessing Commodore couldn't quite stretch to paying him to appear in TV ads though, as media personality Henry Morgan, best known as a panellist on the TV game show I've Got a Secret, became the commentator in a series of successful commercials. This not only added star appeal to Commodore's product, but also helped them get noticed by the exact audience they were trying to appeal to. Very clever marketing indeed, as not only did Shatner have widespread appeal from his TV and film outings, but was also widely worshipped by geeks like me, who already had a passion for home computing. The next fact, as short and sweet as it is, has to be my favourite, because it's so amusing. When it was launched in Germany, the VIC-20 had to be renamed the VC-20 instead. This is because the pronunciation of VIC in German sounds like the expletive Fick, which as you might have guessed, is the same as the F word we have in English. This new VC moniker turned out to be quite clever however, as Commodore marketed it as though it was an abbreviation of Volk's computer, which literally means people's computer, using emetology similar to the incredibly famous and iconic Volkswagen brand, which means people's car. Commodore might have been the first computer company to face this problem when marketing their products abroad, but they certainly weren't the last, as in the year 2000, Sega struck deals with football clubs all around the world to market the Sega brand and the Dreamcast via shirt sponsorship. This was all fine until it came to signing a deal with Sampdoria in Italy's Serie A, who soon pointed out that the phrase Mesa Sega meant something akin to pipsqueak, meaning someone who is insignificant and unimportant and was quite a cutting insult in the Italian language, so Sega wisely avoided the name of the company and just won't be Dreamcast on the shirts instead. As we already know, Commodore's first colour computer arrived in Japan before anywhere else, as the VIC-1001, but was struggling to gain a foothold in an already crowded market. Bosses at Commodore knew that if they were going to break the Japanese market, they would need some big name arcade titles to entice their potential audience. 
So they hastily struck deals with both Japanese coin-up company Namco, who were riding high on the success of Pac-Man and Galaxian, as well as the historic arcade giant who licensed those titles and more for the West in Bally Midway. The three big name games that Commodore licensed from Namco for release on the new game's capable hardware was Galaxian, Rally X and Pac-Man. Sadly, the lure of these big name titles did not work as the company hoped, and the Vic 1001 very much continued as it also ran in the Japanese market. A country whose consumers are notoriously patriotic and no doubt saw Commodore as an unwanted immigrant. The company hoped to recoup some cash when they released these coin-up conversions in the West, but they soon hit a huge snag that had somehow been glossed over when they signed the original deal. Not only did the Namco license have a limited timescale, but it also didn't include any rights outside of Japan. As they had been sold separately, and rather ironically, it was Commodore's other arcade partner, Bally Midway, that had made the astute acquisition for their home territory. This left Commodore with a pretty large conundrum. The systems were struggling to make any impact on the Japanese market, and there was no way they were going to recoup their expensive investment on the Namco license. So the decision was made to rebrand all the games, with Galaxian becoming Star Battle, Pac-Man became Jelly Monsters, and Rally X morphed into Radar Rat Race. Even with the lack of name appeal, these titles went on to become some of the Vic's most beloved and well-remembered games. One of the most interesting subplots of this period in Commodore's history, and indeed that of the Vic-20 in particular, is the huge price war that Jack Trammell engaged in against his many rivals. I've already spoken about how Jack went out to undercut Apple and Tandy Radio Shack with his new computer, but he also found himself in a fight against both Atari, who had already conquered the gaming sector and now wanted to dominate home computing too, and Texas Instruments, who had already forced Commodore out of the calculator market and wanted to repeat that feat. Commodore's computer launched in 1981 at the then quite reasonable price of $300, around three times that in today's money. With Texas Instruments' new TI-99 4A computer retailing at $525. Then, around six months later, Texas Instruments lowered the price of their computer to $450, making it more competitive with the VIC-20 and a lot more attractive too, given that it was much more powerful. Then, in early 1982, they lowered the price again to just under $400, which is what really kicked off the heated price war between the two great calculator rivals. TI soon responded by cutting the wholesale price of the 4A by $100, whilst also offering a $100 rebate directly to consumers, lowering the retail price to around $200. TI's official spokesman, disgraced comedian Bill Cosby, who had been hired to combat the star power of Commodore's Bill Shatner, joked how easy it was to sell a computer by paying people $100 to buy one in the company's advertising. By the end of 1982, Commodore lowered the price of their own VIC-20 to match the $200 price of the TI-99 4A. Come the Winter CES show in 1983, TI was celebrated the excellent sales of their computer, which had peaked at 30,000 units a week. But by the start of the following year, Commodore again lowered the price of its own computers, and rather predictably, in February, TI responded with a new retail price of $150 for the 4A. Then, in April, the VIC-20's bundled retail price dropped to an incredibly low $100, and the 4A soon followed suit. In the spring of 1983, TI came out with a new cost-reduced model of their computer to help them continue the war, and also started offering half-price peripherals, as well as adding huge bundles of software to their offering worth over $100. Huge discounts on all their software soon followed too, and Jack Trammell no doubt sensed their desperation. And then Jack finally got his revenge, as shortly afterwards TI announced a pre-tax loss from home computers of over $200 million. This caused its stock to drop by a third in two days. This was the beginning of the end for their computer, with shareholders putting TI under huge pressure to discontinue the TI-99 4A and orphan it completely. After losing $111 million after taxes in the third calendar quarter of 1983, TI finally threw in the towel and officially discontinued the TI-99 4A. In 
In April 1980, at a meeting of general managers at the British headquarters, Jack Trammell declared he wanted a low-cost colour computer when most of the general managers were arguing against it, preferring Chuck Peddle's more sophisticated TOI design, which I mentioned earlier. Jack himself is quoted as saying, The Japanese are coming, so we must become the Japanese. This was declared in reference to the ongoing threats of new low-cost systems from Japan. This was also in keeping with Trammell's philosophy of building computers for the masses, not the classes. The new concept was supported at the meeting by Michael Tomschik, the new hired marketing strategist and assistant to Jack himself, general manager of Commodore Japan, Tony Tokai, and Kit Spencer, who is the UK's top marketing executive. Legendary MOS engineer Chuck Pedal disagreed with this decision and subsequently left the company, along with a number of other engineers. After these discussions, Tom Sick wrote a 30-page memo detailing new recommendations for the then still in development computer and presenting it to Trammell himself. These included adding programmable function keys, which was inspired by competing Japanese micros, a full-size typewriter keyboard, and built-in RS-232 interface. Tom Chick insisted on user-friendliness as the prime directive for the new computer and proposed a retail price of under $300. He then recruited a marketing team and a small group of computer enthusiasts who would work closely with colleagues in the UK and Japan to create the colourful packaging, user manuals and first wave of software applications. Interestingly, Jack's long predicted invasion of the Western computer market by cheaper Japanese rivals never really happened. A number of companies including the likes of Sharp, Sword and Hitachi did try and fail with only the Japanese-created MSX standard gaining any kind of traction, partly thanks to the support of Western companies like Philips Electronics and Spectra Video. The VIC-20 certainly didn't face many criticisms by either the press or consumers of the age, but one area where it did come in for stick was the poor built-in basic that it offered, by the time of the VIX release, newer models of the PET had just been upgraded to, Co to Commodore BASIC 4.0. Amongst the improvements in the latest version were disk drive commands and improved garbage collection. However, the VIX-20 reverted to the 8K BASIC 2.0 used on earlier PETs. Part of the reason for this was keeping to the design team's goal of limiting the system ROMs to only 20 kilobytes. Another big issue with this was that having been designed for the PET, which only had limited audio-visual capabilities, Commodore's BASIC had no dedicated sound or graphics features. This meant that budding VIC-20 programmers had to use a large number of poke and peek commands to get round this. This was in huge contrast to the computer's main competitors, such as the Atari 400 and TRS-80 colour computer, both of which had fully featured BASIC with full support for the machine's sound and graphics hardware. Supplying a more limited and readily available BASIC on the VIC-20 also helped keep the price low, rather than paying out to license Microsoft BASIC or develop a new one of their own. To somewhat solve the many issues encountered with Commodore BASIC, the company released a BASIC extender cartridge that added a range of different graphics and sound commands later on. At the time of the VIC-20's design, Commodore had a glut of 512-byte SRAM chips, left over from the early PET models and calculators, so Jack Trammell, at his thrifty best, decided these should be used in the new computer. It was decided that the total RAM would be 5K, so 10 of them were needed on the board. This chip count was dramatically reduced on revised models, however. The amount of memory in the VIC was very small even for 1980 standards, which did mean it came in for some criticism from the press, but the Commodore engineers had taken a leaf out of Atari's book to help fix this problem, and future-proof the new computer somewhat in the process. Like the Atari 400 and 800, the VIC-20's RAM was expandable through the cartridge port. RAM cartridges were available in several sizes, 3K, with or without an included Super Basic extension ROM, 8K, 16K, 32K and even 64K. The latter of two were only available from third-party vendors, however. 
This did cause another headache though, as the internal memory map is dramatically reorganised with the addition of each cartridge, leading to a situation where some programs only work if the right amount of memory is present. To help fix this, the 32K and 64K cartridges had switches and software setups allowing the RAM to be enabled in user selectable memory blocks. One of the greatest accolades that the VIC-20 holds is the achievement of becoming the first personal computer to sell over a million units. When you consider that the VIC-20 competed against big name home micros like the Atari 400-800, Apple II, TRS-80 and Sinclair ZX-81, this is quite an achievement. In total, Commodore sold around 2.5 million computers, making a huge success story for the company and the appeal of the VIC-20 as a multi-purpose micro very much influenced what came next for the company. Which was of course the Commodore 64, which featured a pretty similar external design but vastly superior internals that included 64K of RAM, 16 colour graphics and of course that famous SID chip for sound. The C64 also greatly surpassed the sales of the VIC-22, with reports suggesting sales of up to 17 million units worldwide making it the world's best-selling home computer until the arrival of the Raspberry Pi, although many people counter this claim as they either don't consider the Pi a proper home computer or they cite its many different variants being added together. As a side note, the VIC modem was also the first computer peripheral to sell over a million units too, very much adding to those bragging rights. The VIC-20 wasn't officially discontinued by Commodore until January 1985, but due to its huge success, it was still supported by third-party companies for several years later. When it comes to video games, nobody compares to Atari. I find Intellivision more sophisticated and lifelike. Gentlemen, move over for my friend Vic. The Commodore Vic-20. Move over. The Commodore Vic-20 does more than your machines. It's a great computer that also plays great games. Like this, and this, and this. A computer that plays great games? Under $300? Exactly. We, we didn't know. Get the Commodore VIC-20 computer for under $300. And that runs up my look at 10 amazing Commodore VIC-20 facts. But which one of these fabulous facts was your favourite? Or can you think of any other tantalising tidbits of trivia that I didn't include? I always love to hear the thoughts and views of my audience, so please get typing in that comment section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal patrons for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following patrons and YouTube backers in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Grady Haynes, D Vaughan, Mitchell Valentino, Neptune, Sethe Robinson, Carl Olson, Dos Gamer Man, Sonic Mania 999, Paul Daniel, James Taylor, Retro Resolution, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all, all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now, where you can get access to a host of content including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights and much more besides. I've been the Laird, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.